where to begin uh, in all of this. It's a very long, complicated story, and we're going to make it uh, easy. Um, but let me just say, at the beginning, there is a very, very important, there's a lot of important archaeology connected and associated with this. And I did ask someone to come along, and at the last moment, that person had to cancel. So I'm not going to even pretend to do the archaeology. Uh, Vernon, who comes to the congregation, could have handled it really well, but he's not here. We will see a couple of things, at least the ritual immersion baths and the so-called Essene Gate, uh, at least. All right, but we're here for the cemetery because it is um, <coughs> All Saints Day. And uh, so how does this story begin? Okay, we'll begin it very briefly by saying, okay, many are the sins and the faults of the Anglican Church, okay, uh, but uh, not being mission-minded uh, is not one of those. So wherever Anglicans have gone, they've brought, uh, they've been very missionary-minded, and uh, they have uh, sent missionaries and schools and clinics and hospitals and so on and so forth. That is all the heritage, in a way, of the, uh, all of that starts. Uh, it didn't start at the beginning with Anglicanism. It started with the Anglican revival in the early 19th century. There was a revival, okay, because of the French Revolution. People saw in Britain what was happening in France, the nobility and the aristocracy, the people who were posh and the people who had lots of money and the people who had everything to lose from uh, insurrection and, res and revolution thought, oh my goodness, they just cut off the head of the king. They cut off the head of the queen. They have declared the, the French state to be uh, an agnostic state. No religion. And so these people who probably hadn't gone to church uh, most of their lives all of a sudden went back to church in certain fear and trepidation. And guess what? The Lord met them there. And uh, there was a revival. And the revival started amongst people who were rich and famous and who were members of parliament, uh, who were lords and ladies. And it's kind of interesting that it did. And uh, because these folks all believed that uh, the, the events that happened in France were actu uh, actually the sign of the end of the age. And they were basically, I don't know, won't go into all the definitions of this, but they were post-millennialist. They believed that uh, the world had to get better and become more and more Christian, and when it did, Jesus would come back. Okay, they were very optimistic. They weren't pessimistic as we, as we are today. And so they thought, oh my goodness, if Jesus is coming back soon, he has to come back to a world that knows the gospel. We better get busy. And these people with money and organizational skills and contacts and influence began to create one missionary society after another. Okay? They created the, the, the Bible Society. They created the Church Missionary Society. They created a missionary society for South Africa and a missionary society for uh, in the city of London and a society for, societies for, for, uh, for India. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they also created CMJ out of wow. this, the, or the London Jews Society. All because that because they're because they're post millennialists, they thought or they believed, they understood that they and this is classic post millennialism, that you can speed up or slow down the coming of the Lord by the things that you do or don't do. So they sent missionaries and they sent missionaries to this part of the world. And the first missionary shows up here in 1826. Okay, first Protestant missionary. His name is David. Who? Who's who's the Mia Rishon? David Pelegi. No, <laughs> David Pelegi. Been here a long time, but not that long. Aviel. Uh, John Nicolason. John Nicolason. He's the first prodigy. He's a a Dane. Okay, yes. who works for the London Jew Society. He shows up here. Okay, and. Uh, a doctor uh, actually comes out just a little bit before him. Remember the doctor's name? I know he dies very Wilson. soon, yeah. <laughs> and guess what? When missionaries went out in the 19th century, especially to this country, sometimes literally and other times figuratively, they brought their caskets. Yeah, they brought their <laughs> coffins. 
Aaron. Uh, okay, they brought their, their, their caskets. Aaron. Okay, because they knew they were not coming back. Okay, that, that, that's the kind of life that people were prepared, you know, uh, people were prepared to sacrifice. And uh, this cemetery is full of not only policemen and archaeologists and soldiers, but it's also full of, it's also full of, uh, of uh, missionaries and people who gave their lives. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it's figuratively speaking. They knew they would never come back, mm -hmm. and there are stories of people going to India and other places, literally bringing their coffins and using it as a suitcase you know, to pack their belongings. <laughs> okay, so Protestant missionaries came out here, and you know, like all people, they started to die. So the question is, where do you bury people? Then bury them in a Catholic cemetery. They bury them in a Greek Orthodox cemetery, and they started to bury them uh, in the cemetery at Mamilla, okay, which is a Muslim cemetery. All right, that was the first Protestant cemetery here, but that didn't work out very well because when the Christians wanted to have services, the Muslims said, "No, we'll say the prayers over the dead because our prayers are just as good as your prayers," and that didn't that didn't go down very well with a very small evangelical Protestant community. Finally, they found a way of just north of David's tomb here, having another small Protestant cemetery. And uh, then something happened, uh, something happened that was quite interesting, is that Christ Church was built. All right? So all of you know about the history of Christ Church, but most of you don't remember or may not remember that Christ Church was actually built to be a united Protestant church in the Holy Land. And they were going to, Abiel, who, who did we make a, a marriage with? The Anglicans married Lutheran. the Lutherans, <coughs> okay? And uh, so this was a united, very odd, very odd animal, okay? Nothing has ever existed like this before in church history. And uh, actually the British really, they, how shall we say, they really shanghaied the Germans in this. They got the Germans to pay for everything, okay? <laughs> and the British remained, were, they had total control. Okay, the German, German, German money, British power. Okay, uh, very, very clever the way it all operated, and this, this diocese, okay, which at first it was sponsored by a kind of the, the chief sponsor was CMJ or the London Jew Society, united all the Protestant work in the country. All right, and uh, lo and behold, okay, you needed a cemetery, so together. The diocese, the Lutherans and the Anglicans together, eventually bought this piece of property in 1848. And they paid 100 pounds for it. Wow. And another 200 pounds to, uh, to fix it up. Why did they choose this piece of property? Because probably it was the most available, ex accessible piece of property closest to Christchurch. Okay? Mm -hmm.